Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the program. And on this episode, I'm going to be talking about a feature film that will make you question every relationship you ever have from now on. Because here's the thing. You may think that you know someone, but so did Jane Marvin. And as you're about to see, her story unfolded quite horrifically. It's the Alligator People. Now, I know you're probably thinking, Mark, you're being ridiculous. Alligator people aren't real. Well, what makes you so sure? There are plenty of theories out there that reptilian people walk among us today. They're out there right now, maybe. So that makes this film even scarier because it may not be that far from reality. The movie starts in a sanitarium inside the office of Dr. Wayne McGregor, where he calls in his friend Harry from med school to have him help him with the case. On the phone you said you were having a serious problem with a young girl. Yeah, nurse here as a matter of fact. Pretty. <laughs> Here's her case history. Jane Marvin. Yeah, that's the name she's using. Very competent girl. And pretty. Holy crap, does this guy have a raging boner or what? Oh, I've got this case uh, involving this girl. Oh, okay, is she pretty? I mean, Come on, Wayne, I didn't drive 45 minutes over here to help you with an ugly patient. Uh, there's gotta be something in this for me, too. So he brings in Jane, one of his nurses, and gets ready to inject her with sodium pentothal. Got a nice sharp one for you this time. That's right. I swear, sometimes it feels like doctors back then were all sadists to some degree. I mean, you go and get a flu shot now, and you don't even see the needle unless you're looking at the spot. Back then, it was like they were trying to shove it right in your face. Like, oh yeah, this is gonna go right in ya. And look at this guy. Oh, I got a nice sharp one for you this time. Then he jams it in. So now, loaded up with truth juice, Jane starts telling the story of what happened to her. Turns out her name is actually Joyce, and she was married at one point. Then you are married? I was. This guy's probably like, yeah, tell us all about that. Specifically, like, the wedding, the wedding night, you know, did, uh, is the sex good? You know, any favorite positions? Do you, how many times a week do you do it, you think? Ballpark. I'm not sure whether I am married. Just keep your hands where we can see them. So now we see a flashback of Joyce and her new husband Paul on a train. Turns out they met when Joyce was nursing overseas and Paul was in a terrible plane crash. Then they get a bunch of telegrams and start going through them until suddenly Paul gets up and leaves and asks if they're gonna be stopping anytime soon. Which brings up the question, what was in that telegram? What was so urgent that made Paul want to go and make a phone call right then and there? <laughs> Don't do it, Paul. The whole Nigerian prince thing is just a way to get money out of you. I mean, I don't know this for sure, but I have a hankering suspicion that whoever's sending those out isn't even a prince. Yeah, I know. Shocking. So at the mail stop, Paul kisses his new wife and gets off the train, never to be seen again. Joyce can't find Paul anywhere, so she starts digging into his army records and finds out he was originally from Georgia. What about where he was born? His family? The army records said Georgia. Paul had never mentioned his family. I never thought to ask him. Imagine how hilarious it would be to get engaged to someone and then realize you've never asked about their family. Like it just comes up for the first time suddenly when you're trying to figure out the seating plan for the wedding. Hey, honey, where do you think we should uh, seat your, uh... Hey, uh... Just gonna throw this at you. <laughs> do you have a family or something? Anyways, a few months later, Joyce finds out that he was part of a fraternity at Louisiana State University and gets the home address he gave them when he enrolled. Then she takes a train to Bayou Landing and doesn't have a plan of what to do next. So she sees a crate marked radioactive material at the train station 
and decides to sit on it because, well, if she doesn't find Paul, at least she won't go home empty-handed. Because there's no souvenir quite like some cancer. So then a man with a hook for a hand comes to pick up the radioactive material. Which is hilarious. I like how package delivery hasn't really changed all that much in 60 years. Okay, I've got some radioactive material here. Nobody to sign for it. Alright, well I guess I'll just leave it here. Out in the open. Hopefully nobody steals it. But then again, why do I care? So then Joyce asks the man who pulled up in a truck with the cypresses written on it if he's ever heard of a plantation called the cypresses. So the hook man, named Manon, takes Joyce out deep into the swamp, full of snakes and alligators and fake driving sequences. Turns out Manon hates alligators so much that he spends his spare time trying to run them over and shoot at them all because they bit off his hand. I mean, yeah, alligators bit off my hand, so I'm gonna just try and kill them every time I see them. I'm not gonna stop working at the place that's surrounded by alligators. That would just be <laughs> ridiculous. You know how long you'd last if you got a hundred yards off of this road? <laughs> Maybe 10 minutes. If the quicksand didn't get you, the moccasins would. Yeah, and he's not talking about snakes. Deadly attacks by soft shoes were 8,000% higher in 1959 than they are today. It's a shocking statistic, I know, but we should all just be thankful that it's one we've really improved on. So she goes to the main house and asks Mrs. Hawthorne if she knows anything about her husband. And she's like, nope, don't know what you're talking about. Get the hell out of here. But there's just one problem. The last train has already left for the day. So Mrs. Hawthorne is like, ah, shit, fine. You can stay here for the night. You can have anything you want. Just ask the servants, but you can't leave your room. So this is basically like staying at a hotel with room service and everything is completely free, which you'd think would be a pretty sweet deal. But Joyce isn't satisfied. Is it true everything she told me? Have I come to the wrong place? I can't. I wouldn't like to say anything, ma'am. Well, can't you tell me anything? I can tell you this. This is a trouble house. Real, deep, big trouble. Go, child. Please go. This is a trouble house. Yeah, you keep saying that, but I don't quite follow you. You know, do you mean that in the sense that there's a lot of bad things going on with the people in this house? Or do you mean it more in the sense of like a Home Alone type situation where there's traps all over the place. So then Mrs. Hawthorne is like, oh crap, she's here. And she calls a scientist to tell him that Paul's wife is there looking for him. And he's like, oh crap, we gotta figure out what to do. Then she goes over to the lab where a bunch of guys are trying to restrain someone who doesn't want to stay in bed. And quite frankly, I can totally see why. I mean, just look at that bed. That looks really uncomfortable. The whole thing is covered in plastic. Do you know how hot and sweaty that thing would get? Especially, you're in a swamp in Louisiana where the air is humid as all hell? So finally, they resort to the old-fashioned way of getting someone to calm down, and the doctor jabs them with a needle, as we've already established was the style at the time. And then we see the horrifying truth. This person doesn't have a face. That, or this is just a cover, which quite frankly, I would love a hoodie like that. Like. Would you, could you imagine wearing a hoodie that had just like a pull down shade? You could just pull it down and take a nap whenever, or just not talk to people. Anyways, later that night, a man in a trench coat sneaks into the main house to satisfy his late night urge to play the piano. And I gotta give credit to all you people out there who play the piano, because I took piano lessons when I was 10, and I vividly remember it because I really sucked at it. I don't think I've ever told this story before, but yeah, when I was a kid, uh, I took piano lessons and then at one point my piano teacher had a recital at her house where all of her students and their parents came over and each kid one by one would go up to the piano and play a song and you know show what they've learned over the past year. And I remember walking into the house and going into the living room where the piano was and there was a Super Nintendo just sitting there on pause on the TV like ready to go. And I'm like how the hell do you expect me to focus on playing the piano, something I don't want to do, while there's a 32-bit gaming system right here just begging to be played. Which, you know, at the time, 32 bits was like, oh my god. 
load blowing. So all these other kids go up and play their songs and they're like miles ahead of me, you know, like child prodigies playing Beethoven, using the pedals. So it's my turn and I go up there and you're supposed to introduce yourself in the song. So I turn to the audience and just say, hi, I'm Mark and this is Yankee Doodle. And I got up to the part where he put the feather in his hat, called it macaroni. Right after the macaroni, total dog's breakfast. It just turned into a gong show. I had no idea the rest of the song, so I just kind of made some stuff up, and then I just stopped playing. And there was a feeling that washed over me of like, I'm not really that embarrassed because I don't care. And <laughs> as I was just kind of bowing, I was like, yeah, I never have to do this ever again. Anyways, Joyce hears the piano and goes downstairs to tell whoever it is to shut up. But he runs out the door, and this must be the most inconsiderate person of all time. Comes in, uninvited, in the middle of the night, makes a bunch of noise, and then leaves a bunch of crap all over the floor. Well, it turns out it's Paul, and look at him. He's either horribly disfigured or just hasn't been using sunscreen properly. Do I really have to say this again? You gotta let it soak in. 15 minutes! So now the doctor shows up in something that I think we should start seeing more of in our society, and I don't know why we haven't been. I mean, this is like some James Bond shit. Half car, half boat, sign me up. This is the type of flex that just can't be rivaled. Imagine just cruising down the street in this thing. Hey ladies, wanna go for a ride? Land or sea? And not only that, I believe with this type of versatility, traffic jams will be significantly decreased. Think about it, you're, you're stuck in traffic? Ah, oh, yeah, you know, this sucks, we're all stuck here. Oh, well, look, there's a river right beside the road. Done. Anyways, Joyce doesn't want to leave until she gets some answers. So she decides to go into Mrs. Hawthorne's office and just starts going through her mail. She's probably thinking, well, what's she gonna do? Attack me with her cane? I can take that bitch. I'm not leaving here, Mrs. Hawthorne, until I get the answers to the questions that brought me here. I told you yesterday you were mistaken. I think you're lying. You can't talk to me like that. I can say a lot worse. You had Dr. Sinclair come and talk to me today, didn't you? Why? To find out how much I knew? Oh, shit! Wait, wait that's not that bad. Well, you, you think that's worse? How is that worse? What the hell was that? I want to see some sparks here. Come on! I'd be the last one ever to hurt Paul. I'm his mother. His mother? <laughs> okay, now we're getting some good stuff. This just got awkward. Surprise mother-in-law. Probably wouldn't expect a Christmas card anytime soon. So later that night, Paul comes back and Joyce chases after him into the rain deep into the swamp, over the fake alligator, and soon she finds herself being rescued from a snake by Captain Hook himself, who takes her back to his swamp shack. Here, have a drink. I don't think I want it. Go on, baby. It'll do you good. Dude, you just drank right from the jug. She's probably like, I don't want any of your backwoods backwash. But here's where Manon reveals his true intentions. But here comes Paul to the rescue. And I have to say, I actually like this fight scene. It's very clear what's happening. So after he takes her back to the house, he goes to the doctor and is like, all right, that's enough, Mark. You gotta move forward with the laser. Yes, the doctor's name is Mark too. No relation. And Dr. Mark is like, no, it's too risky. We have to run experiments first. So now Dr. Mark reveals to Joyce what's really going on. Here's the deal. Dr. Mark was fascinated by the ability that reptiles have to heal themselves and regrow their limbs. So he created a serum to try and replicate that process in humans, which is why after the plane crash that left Paul so mangled, he was able to heal completely. But the problem is that now Dr. Mark's patients are starting to mutate and turn into alligator people. So he gets the idea that maybe if I combine x-rays and gamma rays and just blast them with a ton of radiation, it will cure my patients. Which, I mean, I don't understand the science behind it, but to me that just seems like too much radiation. I get nervous when I get x-rays every time I go to the dentist, and I don't think that's my fault. I find it interesting that they throw that lead vest on you beforehand, like, oh yeah, don't worry. All these organs will be totally fine while we're shooting 
x-rays into your head. So rest assured, if you develop brain cancer, your torso will be in pristine condition though. All right, I'm gonna go hide behind that wall because I do not wanna be in this room when those x-rays start going off. You're gonna be fine though, totally safe. So here we go, it's the big moment where we're just gonna blast Paul in the face with gamma rays and hope for the best. You all right? Fine. Keep your eyes closed. Just relax. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know if it's just me and my anxiety, but I would find it extremely difficult to relax in that situation. Like, all right, we've pointed the laser gun at your head and we're about to basically shoot a Chernobyl amount of radiation at your face. We have no idea if this is going to work or what the long-term effects could be. Uh, and if it doesn't work, you're just gonna continue slowly turning into an alligator, but uh, fingers crossed, you know, just uh, relax. And oh no, here comes Manon. He's got a score to settle with Paul. But it looks like the experiment isn't going so well. Everything starts sparking and smoking and oh my God, Paul has gone full alligator. Look, I don't know about you, but this is the fight I've wanted to see since I was a kid. Captain Hook versus the alligator. I bet some of you are probably sitting there going, actually, technically, Mark was a crocodile. Guess what? I, I, don't, I don't care. Why don't you just let me run my f***ing show? But it's a good thing that Manon really sucks at pretty much everything, like dating, shooting, and swinging his own arms because he manages to electrocute himself. Of course, Paul can't see his own face, so he's like, tell me, how bad is it? I feel like I have more teeth and that there's a nose in my mouth. I mean, my pants still fit. That's a good sign, right? I hate to go from a size 34 to a 36 because then I have to change everything in my closet. So Paul runs out into the swamp and Joyce follows him as the lab blows up. And that's when Paul catches a glimpse of himself in the reflection of the water and has the tragic realization that his hairline will never be the same. So he jumps into the water because he's pissed. He's got to take it out on somebody or something like this alligator who really doesn't put up much of a fight. And honestly, dude, why are you fighting the alligator? That's like your crew now. You should be trying to make friends. But instead, he stumbles around the swamp and falls into my greatest childhood fear, quicksand. But honestly, that's not quicksand. That is fast sand. Look at how fast he sinks into that stuff. Just bloop, he's gone. And that's the whole story. A memory which Joyce's brain has obviously repressed, which kind of sucks because if you ask me, that's a story I would want to remember. What an amazing anecdote for when you're at a party. Hey everybody, uh, who wants to tell messed up relationship stories? By the way, your 10th anniversary giveaway code word for this video is towel. So Wayne is like, what should I do here? Do I reveal to her everything she told us? or just let her keep on repressing this traumatic event. Excuse me, doctor. I'm going off duty unless there's something else. All right. Thank you. Oh, Jane. One moment. Well? Yes, doctor. That's all, Jane. Good night. Good night, doctor. Now, it's better to just leave it be you know, that's some good old 1950s therapy right there. All that traumatic stuff from your past, just bury it. Bury it deep, deep down. It's much better to let sleeping dogs lie than address the underlying issues. It might manifest later on into something much worse, but uh, it might not, fingers crossed. So what did we learn today? Well, it's quite simple, really. Always be extremely skeptical of the person you're in a relationship with because you never know what kind of bizarre medical experiments they've taken part in. And on that note, thanks for watching guys. I'll see you all next time. It was like they were trying to shove it right in your face. Like, oh yeah, this is gonna go right in ya. What, what do you think about that? Nice, nice and sharp, it's steel and thick and pointy. Oh, I can't wait. What was the wedding night like, uh, sex-wise? Was it good? Any favorite positions? Uh, did he... Did you arrive? Did you climax at all, Jane? Just asking out of pure professional curiosity.